Good afternoon, nursing students. I wanted to take an opportunity to record chapter 12, which encompasses food-related issues. We had issues with Zoom this week and not enough storage for recording, so I'd like to record chapter 12. In summary, we'll look at diet modifications, we'll look at cultural considerations, and then work on non-oral feedings, which encompasses enteral tube feedings and TPN. Pay close attention to the MNT or medical nutrition therapy. Why do we modify diets? Well, it's based on the requirements for a patient. So we could make textural changes to have a liquefied diet or advance it to a puree diet based on the medical condition or their nutrient needs. Diets in the hospital can also be modified based on a certain mineral or macronutrient. For example, a low sodium diet is prescribed to patients that have a history of hypertension. Carb counting is the current modality that we recommend for patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Let's begin with diet modifications for liquid diets. Clear liquid diets, as the name implies, are foods that are clear and liquid at room temperature. So if you look at those glasses, they're pretty clear, you can see through them. They are not gonna give your patients their full nutrition requirements in terms of calories and protein. Um, caffeine and caffeinated beverages are not allowed on clear liquid diets. Examples of clear liquid diet foods include apple juice, grape juice, cranberry juice, clear broth, and decaffeinated tea and decaffeinated coffee. Clear liquid diets unfortunately do contribute to hospital malnutrition. The diet prescription should not be uh, written by the doctor for more than 24 hours. Full liquid diets are liquid at room temperature, but they contain opaque foods, meaning you cannot see through them. Examples on full liquid diets include grits, oatmeal, pudding, ice cream, cream soups, and yogurt. Full liquid diets do supply the adequate calories and protein as well as the micronutrients if they are planned accordingly. Um, they are prescribed for patients who have dysphagia or difficulty chewing and swallowing. However, the cons consistencies are modified um, based on the prescription of the results of the video fluoroscopy or swallowing test. Potential issues are patients that are lactose intolerant, cannot tolerate full liquid diets. It is a lot of um, creamed, um, high dairy items, so they're high in saturated fat and cholesterol. Then we move on to mechanically altered diets. These diets could include any consistency in terms of modifying chopped, ground, mashed, or pureed consistencies. Again, mechanically altered diets are for patients who have difficulty chewing or swallowing. They are a step up from the full liquid diet. Um, and these diets can be given in the interim before a soft or general diet can be tolerated. Whereas the soft diets are whole foods, but they tend to be low in fiber. They are, have low seasoning. And again, this is the next step up from mechanically altered diets um, and considered a transition diet. 
A quick note on common food allergies. Uh, these are the top common food allergies that we typically see in a hospital setting. Some patients are allergic to wheat or they're allergic to the gluten in uh, wheat and white flour products. Some are lactose free. Um, we don't see sugar free too much. There is a high prevalence of nut allergies, especially in the States. Um, shellfish can be pretty severe and then egg free. And as we talked about in lecture, those patients that are allergic to eggs cannot um, get the flu shot um, because it does contain albumin, which is from, which is the protein in eggs. I like to talk now a little bit about food safety, which is really important, um, especially in the hospital. So there isn't any translocation of microorganisms causing food poisoning. The top five bacterial strains involved in food safety include norovirus, salmonella species, clostridium perfringens, Campylobacter species, and Staphylococcus aureus. Make sure you know the symptoms of norovirus. It is a virus, it's viral, and norovirus um, is um, contracted from contaminated fruits and vegetables. Um, if you're at a buffet and the salads on the buffet are prepared by someone who has the virus, um, then there is an increased risk that if you consume the salads, you would also contract norovirus. Also, contaminated water contains norovirus. Um, it's highly contagious. Symptoms we see are vomiting and diarrhea. Patient has a temperature and general malaise. Salmonella is typically from raw or uncooked poultry. Um, we do see it also in eggs. Um, symptoms include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, a temperature, and abdominal cramping. Chipotle, um, a few years ago, there was an E. coli breakout um, where they closed all the Chipotles down, and it was because the ground meat was raw um, and basically undercooked. E. coli, um, typically symptoms that patients experience include abdominal pain and diarrhea. As a nurse, the two most important precautions you must take to prevent the spread of foodborne illness among hospitalized patients include one, washing your hands before serving food and washing your hands after using the bathroom. Pretty simple. This slide contains just a summary of the cultural preferences and cultural considerations among those patients of different cultures. It's important to accept and embrace cultural diversity, especially when it comes to food choices. It helps um, to encourage them to eat uh, in terms of oral intake and also to accept that some of the cultural considerations are based on spiritual beliefs um, and that are practiced in their culture. So you can find the handout that was discussed in lecture and this material is ATI exam material. As we move on to non-oral feedings, the definition is nourishment that is directly into the GI tract. That includes enteral nutrition. So the criteria is if a patient is not able to eat orally for more than 72 hours, then enteral tube feedings are a consideration.
Nurses need to know the criteria when alternative non-oral feedings are required. And the first for enteral tube feedings are indicated when the gut is functioning. So that's the main criteria. Know the indications, um, including if a patient is at high risk for malnutrition, so five days or longer, oral intake is inadequate. Um, and that's based on a three-day to five-day calorie count. And you can see normally after three days if the oral intake is not providing the calories and protein that the patient needs. Other indications for enteral tube feeding are severe dysphagia, third degree burns, short bowel syndrome, in intestinal fistulas, just like uh, the patient in the engagement exercise that you did this week. I also want to mention that some patients may not be able to consume food orally, but some you'll find are unwilling to consume adequate nutrients. And so enteral tube feedings, that's also a criteria for enteral tube feedings. Next, let's discuss the enteral nutrition formulas. So historically, um, way back when, <laughs> when we didn't have standard pre-made formulas, we would actually make, I mean, this was before my time, but the hospitals would actually blenderize whole foods. Um, the downfalls of that is that increases microorganisms, translocation of bacteria. So we do have standard formulas now. So standard, also called polymeric formulas, require a functioning gut. So if there's no problems with the patient, the GI tract is, is functioning normally, then we'll recommend um, a standard polymeric formula. Typically, these formulas provide one to two kilocals per ml. There's different types of standard formulas. Most are milk-based. Um, if a patient can't tolerate milk-based, then we go to the lactose-free. There's high-calorie lactose-free and then just the normal caloric lactose-free. We also have fiber-containing formulas. Um, looking at the picture on your right, Jevity Plus is one of the formulas that contain fiber. Um, this is the one, the standard formula that I'm familiar with that we will um, typically start out with, especially in ICU, because patients tend to have loose stools with enteral tube feeding. So starting them on a fiber containing formula, if their gut is functioning fine, um, is an excellent choice. We also have patients who require a fluid restriction. So we have hypercaloric formulas. Hypercaloric means that they're high calorie, high protein formulas, and they uh, specifically will provide 1.5 to 2.0 kilocals per ml. They'll also provide high nitrogen, um, especially in patients that experience proteinuria, such as um, acute renal or chronic renal disease. If a standardized polymeric formula is not appropriate, then we have specialized formulas, including elemental formulas. Elemental formulas contain pre-digested macronutrients to assist the patient's GI tract in metabolizing nutrition. Elemental formulas are typically used for patients that have malabsorption issues, um, such as cystic fibrosis, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. Modular formulas are not um, full formulas. They contain single macronutrients of carbs, protein, and fat that's added to the other enteral nutrition products to help increase calories, protein, and fat. 
And then lastly, we have specialized formula. And those are designed to meet um, the needs of patients with specific diseases or medical conditions. For example, the brand name Glucerna is used for patients with diabetes because it contains um, a low carb formula. Patients with um, chronic renal disease, there is a Nepro um, that's made by Abbott and that contains, um, it's typically high calories, high protein, fluid restriction, low phosphorus, low potassium. And for patients um, in our current status in the pandemic, COVID, if they're in ICU and if they're intubated and we start enteral tube feedings, we typically put them on a pulmonary formula. Um, it helps de decrease the RQ, which is the respiratory quotient. So how do we select enteral tube feeding formulas for patients? It's basically looking at a fully functioning gut versus those that may malabsorb nutrients, looking at their disease state, if they have a fluid restriction, or if they're in a hypermetabolic state. The link on the top of your slide is the Kangaroo Iris YouTube video where you saw the um, GI surgeon place an NG tube into the patient and um, hopefully you found the technology very amazing and if you would like it to watch it again. <laughs> okay, so next criteria we need to determine how we're going to administer the enteral tube feeding. And based on the duration of the tube feeding, are we going to place it non-surgically or is there gonna be a surgical placement? Method of administration. Three options are continuous, intermittent, and bolus feedings. Continuous rate is typically in a hospital setting so it is on an enteral tube feeding pump and it drips based on the 24 hour period. Intermittent um, is the administration of the enteral feed at specific intervals during the day. So typically we'll take the total volume and divide it by say four, maybe six times a day. And by gravity, we will administer the feeding um, over 30 to 90 minutes. Bolus feedings are described as when large volumes of feeding um, are administered into the stomach only. So typically the total volume um, in my experience is I'll give like five, 500 to 700 mLs per feeding. Um, again, it only goes into um, a G-tube for increased tolerance. So looking at feeding duration, um, short duration is the NG-tube placement because it is of a short duration, so it's non-surgical. If the patient is required to have a tube feeding for a long period of time, then there is a surgical replacement of a G-tube or J-tube. Next, let's, let's look at the different routes for enteral feedings. Most commonly, we see NG tubes, G tubes, and J tubes. I have not seen the ND tubes into the duodenum or the NJ tubes um, into the jejunum. So NG tube is nasogastric, passed through the nose into the stomach. G tube is the gastrostomy tube, surgical placement into the stomach. 
also known as a PEG. Um, and J tube is the jejunostomy tube. Again, surgical insertion into the jejunum of the small intestine. Nurses need to know appropriate placement of tubes based upon the patient's medical condition. So for example, um, if a patient is um, not alert and is in a coma, comatose, the recommendation is to place a J-tube. J-tube criteria would be indicated for patients who are not alert and do not have an intact gag reflex that decreases the risk of aspiration. If your patient um, underwent esophageal resections, secondary to cancer, then you always want to feed below the side of the surgery. So you wouldn't want to put an NG tube down for esophageal surgery. The recommendation is to place a G tube. The first issue is with beginning enteral tube feedings. How do you document placement of the tube? The first time it's important to obtain a chest x-ray to determine placement into the stomach. Subsequent times, um, we typically will obtain a 60 ml syringe and aspirate the gastric contents, and that confirms that the tube is in the stomach. Protocol first is to increase the rate, then the concentration. Uh, positioning of the patient is super important to prevent aspiration. Patients on enteral tube feedings should be in a semi-fowler's position with the head of the bed elevated 30 to 45 degrees. Next, I wanna review certain adverse side effects that may come with enteral tube feedings. First, of course, GI issues, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. That's when we decrease the rate um, and potentially switch to um, an elemental formula or a high fiber formula. Mechanical complications include displacement of the tube into the lungs, um, which causes aspiration or um, damage to the mucosal lining of the stomach, it gets dislodged in there. We will always measure blood levels of the electrolytes, sodium, potassium, phosphorus, and magnesium. Also weight, we measure weight. If there's rapid weight gain um, from like eight to 10 pounds a week, that means the patient is um, receiving too much fluid, is overhydrated, and we need to decrease the rate. They're not absorbing the enteral tube feeding formula. Next is parenteral nutrition, PN or TPN, total parenteral nutrition. So PN is indicated when the gut is non-existent or when the gut needs to rest. PN is infused um, via the superior vena cava or the subclavian vein. So the components include the macronutrients, carbs in the formulation of dextrose, Concentrations that are greater than 10%, they're gonna be hypertonic, so they can only be delivered via a central vein. You can't put that high of dextrose into peripheral nutrition, which goes into the veins in the patient's hand. Amino acids are just a mixture of the essential amino acids. And then fat is used as a concentrated energy source to prevent EFA deficiency. Um, it, typically, we will 
provide a lipid source and triglycerides need to be monitored. So if you've never seen how TPN is administered, um, I want to kind of explain the bags on the right in the picture. Typically we'll have um, the carbs and amino acids in one bag and then the lipids can piggyback off of um, those. In recent times, um, the manufacturers have developed a three-in-one bag, so now we have carbs, amino acids, and fat all in one. So it's called a three-in-one system. What's also extremely important to measure are electrolytes, vitamins and trace minerals, um, and especially um, triglycerides, which I mentioned. Vitamin K is typically not in PN, so it has to be injected IM. So it's important that we measure, um, we will take blood levels every single day if a patient is on PN. There comes a time when we're able to transition patients to either um, oral feedings or going from parenteral to tube feedings. And as I mentioned, the reason why you want to feed into the gut is to decrease the um, atrophy of the GI cells and tissues and decrease um, the translocation of bacteria. Any type of enteral intake, especially like just small sips of juice, will help maintain the GI tract and the gut mucosal. It helps to increase that immunity. And it is, if you remember from chapter three, digestion and absorption, patient's immunity comes directly from the GI tract. So any type of oral feeding will be documented versus a calorie count. When transitioning from enteral nutrition through to oral feedings, it's important to obtain um, an assessment from the speech pathology regarding the patient's swallowing ability. So they'll do a swallowing eval, um, and if the patient is able to swallow, then to encourage oral intake and if they're on tube feedings, we typically, the protocol is to stop the tube feedings one hour before or one hour after. So as the oral intake will increase, we tend to decrease the volume. So going from like 50 to 40, usually in 10 ml increments. And we can discontinue the tube feeding when the calorie count shows that the patient is consuming approximately two-thirds of their energy requirements, so it's about like 66-67%.